Hi, and thank you for watching. Many of you may have wondered where I've been. Well, sometimes you just need a bit of a break from social media and the negative aspects associated with it. And I have taken a bit of time off for a break over December. This has certainly refreshed me. When I wanted to post in the new year, I received two strikes against my account on previous videos that I posted which prevented me from uploading. I want to thank everyone who has expressed their concern about my absence and really do appreciate it. With what is currently happening in the world, I thought I would do a video today that looks at some of the events that have occurred over the past month or two and how these would seem to align with God's word but also with our enemy's predictive programming and also what could be expected in the days that are right before us. On December 4th we had a very peculiar solar eclipse which was in conjunction with Mercury and what I found very interesting was to see how the cryptocurrency markets fell while this eclipse was actually occurring. This immediately reminded me of the message seen in the eyes of this character in the iPad Go 2 animation, which is then followed by war coverage. Now I have to be very careful with what I say next, since I cannot afford another strike against my account. This plunge in the crypto markets was brought about by what is shown on this cover of The Economist magazine, which just happened to cover the week following the eclipse. You will also notice that the shape of the barricade tape that is displayed on this cover forms a pentagram and we are supposed to know by now who the enemy is that is behind all of this. I am just very perplexed at the fact that there are still so many people who remain caught up in the lies that have permeated the world over the past two years and who still cannot see what is really going on. The Bible describes this as a strong delusion, so I guess... It is to be expected that there will be many who will remain caught up in this deception, even when the truth is presented to them. Although the market saw a significant dip on the day of the solar eclipse, I believe much worse is still to come, and the solar eclipse may have marked the starting point of a process through which the world economy will be destroyed. This would also seem to be what the globalists are depicting on their magazine's cover, given the threats that are displayed in the form of a pentagram, with the world's economy being the focus point. Then a little earlier in November of last year, we saw the United Nations positioning a beast, which they call a guardian for international peace and security, in their visitor's plaza. This beast would seem to have all the features that are described to us in the book of Daniel, and more specifically in the book of Revelation chapter 13. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. God's word also tells us that when they say peace and safety, that sudden destruction will come over them, and they will not escape, and this having to do with the return of our bridegroom for those who will escape what is to come. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Jesus also tells us in Luke that we have to watch and pray so that we can avoid being snared by this delusion, because the outcome of being caught in this delusion is to be damned. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not in the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Two things stand out to me like sore thumbs concerning the times that we live in. The first is to see how the truth has been silenced on all the major social and media platforms. No longer can one have open discussions or arguments where people can have differences of opinion and offer proof for their point of view as one could do freely only a few years ago. If a person has an opinion or view that disagrees with the official narrative of those that control these platforms, then they are simply silenced. Secondly, it is to see people's inability to distinguish between what is false and what is true. But how would one be able to distinguish with absolute certainty between what is true and what is false? This reminds me of Pontius Pilate's question to Jesus. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. 
Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. One can only tell the difference between truth and lies after receiving and coming to know the truth which is described to us in John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. Without Jesus and the volume of the book that was written about him, including both Old and New Testaments, it will be very difficult for a person to distinguish between right and wrong. And that is why the delusion that currently has the world in its grips is so great. Jesus' instructions in Luke 21 were given to his people to shield them against the outcome of being caught in this deception, and to patiently continue to trust only in the truth which we know is found in Jesus Christ and his word. Over the past two years our enemy has used fear to lure God's people away from what is written in the Bible, and to offer an alternative to God's promises for our well-being. It is very similar to what happened in the Garden of Eden. God's people, who were perfect and who had no sin, were given a choice, and had free will to choose as they would. Through deception, the enemy used our ability to exercise our free will to his benefit, and to put us at odds with our Heavenly Father. A similar scenario is once again playing out in the world today, where the father of the lie is doing what he does best, lying to God's people and getting them to make the wrong choices by allowing fear to rule over them. Those wrong choices will, as in the case of Adam and Eve, once again lead to the damnation of people who belong to God. And we read about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not in the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. While we are on the subject of Adam and Eve, allow me to deviate for just a minute. Something I've always wondered about was why God did not want Adam and Eve to know the difference between good and evil, when they were created and were perfect and sinless before Him. Why would God not want them to have this knowledge? When we are perfected, we will have this knowledge. This was, in my opinion, the only difference between God's original creation of humanity and the one that will soon be perfected and rule and reign with him during the millennium. Then the Holy Spirit showed me that I was asking the wrong question, and that I was looking at the situation from the wrong perspective. Why do I say this? Well, when there is no sin, there is no evil, and you have nothing to compare good with, and everything that God created in the beginning was perfect and good. So until sin entered the world, it was impossible to know its effects, and how sin and the evil that would come with it, would be opposed to that which God created as perfect and good. This would also imply that sin only entered God's creation when the serpent beguiled Eve, and she ate of the forbidden fruit, and we actually see God's curse being pronounced over Satan at the same time. Before this revelation, I always had the impression that good and evil existed before Eve ate of the fruit, but that this knowledge was intentionally kept from humanity. That would, however, not seem to be the case when considering some other insightful passages from God's Word. This act of rebellion on Satan's side and disobedience on humanity's side would seem to have occurred as part of a singular event in which Satan fell from his position as covering cherub and humanity losing their relationship with their Heavenly Father as a result of our free will being manipulated by an enemy for his benefit and our Heavenly Father allowing all of this so that he can show us the depths of his love for us in the years to come. We find support for this understanding in Ezekiel 28, where we are told how Satan still existed in his glorified state, while he was in the Garden of Eden. Thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. 
thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Here we are told that Satan existed in a sinless state in the Garden of Eden, and it would seem then that when he became prideful and jealous and acted on these thoughts, which led to Eve being beguiled and to disobey God, that sin was introduced into God's creation, which is the first instance in which anyone except our Heavenly Father would have been able to tell the difference between good and evil. This understanding also refutes the gap theory in which many claim that Satan rebelled and that the earth was somehow destroyed and that God had to recreate the earth after it became formless and void. Such an understanding is clearly contradicted by what is shown to us in Ezekiel 28. Another aspect that our Heavenly Father has revealed to me over the past year or so has to do with men and women in our perfected states. I share this with you simply because of the future implications that may be very interesting and exciting, and you are welcome to disagree with me on this, but as always, I believe we have to take into account everything written in the Word of God to bring us to the truth and a proper understanding for what we believe. Many believe that when we receive our glorified bodies, we will no longer have genders, and then men and women will all just be the genderless children of God in heaven. And they draw this conclusion based on Jesus' response to a question by the Sadducees. This is what was said in the exchange. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children, and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry, and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. In this passage, Jesus explains that marriage between a man and a woman is something that only applies to our world, therefore the fallen and sinful world, as opposed to that which will soon be perfected. If one only considers this passage in isolation, it is easy to see why some would believe that people will become the genderless children of God. But there are many other passages that one also has to consider to ensure that one arrives at the truth, and that the understanding does not contradict those other passages in God's word. If a happily married couple only considers this passage from Luke when it comes to their relationship in heaven, it could lead to thoughts of disappointment, doubt, or even apprehension and fear about going to heaven, because what will become of the beautiful relationship that they have now, and how will they relate to each other in heaven if they are no longer married? These are important questions to ask, but it is even more important to obtain the truth before one answers them. When God created man in his perfected state, God said that it is not good for man to be alone, and he then created the woman out of the man. We read about God's original design for man and woman in the following passages. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. How does God's initial design for man and woman compare to the institution of marriage that we have now? From what God's word shows me, marriage is an institution that attempts to bring together a man and a woman after God's design. However, there are some stark differences between how God brings a man and woman together in their perfected state and how marriage attempts to accomplish this in our fallen state. God's design for a man and woman 
that he pairs is for them to be made of the same flesh. So from a DNA perspective, the only difference between the two would be that of their genders. In our earthly marriages, this is certainly not the case. And I've always wondered how this passage from Genesis applies to our marriages here on earth, since it doesn't. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Marriage in this world cannot bring a man and a woman together after God's design, as shown to us in this passage. In light of Jesus' response to the Sadducees, it is also interesting to see then that marriage is nowhere mentioned in this passage from Genesis. A man will simply leave his parents and cleave to his wife, and they will be one flesh. This passage gives us a glimpse of God's perfect design for man and woman. And this would also seem to be a passage with a lot of prophetic significance, since what is explained here in the second half of this passage has never been witnessed since the creation. There has never been a man born to a man and woman who were in a perfect state before God. This will only become a reality when God pairs men and women who were specifically created for each other and made of the same flesh once they are perfected in Jesus. We know that there are varying degrees of compatibility between those who are paired through the institution of marriage. In many cases, people are so incompatible when they are married that they simply cannot stand each other after a few years, leading to that marriage ending in divorce. I am of the opinion that the best compatibility between a married couple that one can find on this earth throughout all of history pales in comparison to what our Heavenly Father intends for everyone that will become part of his son's bride in the ages to come. Imagine the relationships that one would have in heaven, where there is perfect unity between every man and woman, that God specifically created for each other. Knowing that God created a perfect partner for you, that will complement you in every possible way, is just mind-blowing to consider. Unfortunately, many believers only rely on selective passages from the Bible to conclude that our heavenly relationships will probably lack some intimacy between men and women. Another consensus among believers is that there will be no procreation in heaven, and this also being based on the fact that Jesus said that people will not marry in heaven and will be like the angels. But what does God's word show us? When we look at our Heavenly Father's original intentions for man and woman in Genesis as part of his instructions to Adam and Eve, especially when we consider that these instructions were given to them while they were still sinless and in possession of the title deed to the earth, affording them dominion over all of God's creation, we read the following. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Adam and Eve were instructed to be fruitful and to multiply at the time when they were given dominion over the earth, and we know that they existed in their glorified state at this point. So God's original intention was for humanity to multiply before sin was introduced. To claim that our Heavenly Father's will for us is to be genderless and that in the ages to come, children will simply no longer exist, would maybe be a slight deviation from what is shown to us in Scripture, and would not align at all with what our Heavenly Father intended for us. We know that our enemy's desire is for people to do away with their God-given identities, and not to have children, and this is a tendency that has certainly influenced the world exponentially over the past few decades. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine what heaven would be like if there were no children? How can the kingdom of heaven be compared to little children coming to Jesus, if our heavenly Father intended to have no children in heaven. That would probably be one of the saddest things one could imagine about heaven, from a view that is not supported by Scripture. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The word, which is the truth, tells us that God changes not. 
That means that the same principles that apply to Adam and Eve in their perfect state will also apply to humanity once we are perfected. And if Adam and Eve were told to be fruitful and to multiply, and to rule with God over his creation, should we not expect the same to be true in the ages to come? If we claim that God's design for man and woman in the ages to come will be different to that which is shown to us in Genesis, we either have to believe that God changes over time, or that he made some mistakes when he initially created man and woman. I think that it is important to know that we do not serve a God who makes mistakes, and because he knows the end from the beginning, it would be the easiest thing for him to avoid making mistakes, because he knows the outcome of something before it begins. Such abilities would even assist us in avoiding making mistakes. He also tells us clearly in this passage from Malachi that he does not change. So there is therefore no biblical grounds, if one considers everything that is said, to believe that people will be genderless children of God without the ability to have children in the ages to come. I know this may be somewhat controversial for many, but I am simply showing you what is written in the Bible, and it fills me with hope and excitement to think about the perfect relationships and unions that await us in heaven. Far better than anything we could ever hope for on this earth, and none of the doubt, fear and apprehension that often accompany many believers' thoughts when they think about what may await us in heaven. Coming back to the deception that currently blankets the world, just as in Adam and Eve's case we see today how our enemy offers the world a form of life and the promise of health that is proven to be false and which does not align with the truth of Scripture. Instead, our enemy is deceiving people through a great delusion into receiving his mark as described to us in Revelation 19 verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Fortunately, just as in Adam and Eve's case, we know that our Heavenly Father always has a plan to rescue those that He created in His image. And just as He allowed Satan to deceive Eve into disobedience so that He could show us that He would go as far as becoming a servant of humanity who would lay down His life to save us, and just as He allowed our enemy to put Jesus to death where Satan thought that this was his greatest victory, Satan simply did what our Heavenly Father needed to do so that we could be set free from sin and discover the depths of our Heavenly Father's love for us. I believe our Heavenly Father's intention with the great delusion is similar to the two instances previously mentioned. Our enemy is allowed to unlawfully obtain that which belongs to God, and he will face a legal case through which he will be required to give back sevenfold of what he had stolen, as instructed in Proverbs 6 verse 30 to 31. So for those who have realized too late that they were caught in the enemy's trap, there is yet hope, because we serve a God who is love, and who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. So what can we expect in the days ahead? There is one passage in Luke that always features in my mind when I think about the situation in the world, as we await our blessed hope, and that passage is found in Luke chapter 21. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. One aspect that has been missing for me over the years of watching for the return of our bridegroom was Jesus' reference to the nations and kingdoms that will rise against each other at the time of the end. We have never seen that part of the passage being fulfilled to the degree that we are seeing today with what is currently happening in the world. Not only do we see the nations of NATO rising against Russia and its allies, China and Iran, but there is also tension mounting between China and Taiwan, North Korea and its neighbors, and signs of war breaking out in the Arab Peninsula. Seeing the tensions rising between so many nations all at the same time tells me that our escape from this world is closer than ever. And on top of this, we have the United Nations saying peace and safety through the beast statue that they revealed in November of 2021. Is there anything in our enemy's predictive programming that would give us some pointers to what they plan to do next? Firstly, 
Why do I consider our enemies predictive programming? The only reason for it is because I believe that our enemy knows exactly when the rapture will occur, and he has meticulously been preparing for that moment over the past 2000 years. Satan is called the Prince of the Power of the Air, and that location also represents where God's timepiece can be found. The Book of Enoch shares with us how angels explain to Enoch how God's timepiece works, and through this information it was possible to create a calendar that accurately positions the seasons and the Lord's feast days as they relate to the seasons. Now if the angels know how to read God's timepiece, which was given to mark appointed times and seasons, why would Satan not be able to read it? If the book of Revelation tells us about several stars falling to the earth, and we as humans have acquired the technology through which we can track celestial objects through space, why would our enemy not be in a position to know when those objects will hit the earth? The first of which would also seem to mark the point at which Satan is cast down to the earth. I believe Satan knows exactly when his appointed time will start, and that is why he has pointed to the date through predictive programming, even though we are not always clever enough to figure it out. The Bible goes further to tell us that the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light, and for those who do not believe me, it is written in Luke chapter 16. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. This passage applies in particular to our generation, because the children of light, in many cases, lack the knowledge that could save them, because they are not watching and praying as instructed by their bridegroom. We also read in Isaiah that God's people perish because they lack knowledge, and over the past two years we have seen a perfect application of this passage from Hosea, where many of God's people have walked into the enemy's trap with their eyes open, not knowing what it was that they were doing to themselves, and forgetting or even denying what God's word has to say about the source of our well-being. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. That is part of the reason why I believe Jesus told us to watch and pray, so that we would not be caught in the enemy's trap, or miss out on the knowledge that would inform us about our enemy's intentions when this was presented to us. One piece of predictive programming that I believe focuses in detail on the events leading up to the tribulation is the iPetco 2 animation, which was released in 2012. This animation showed us that everything that has led to where the world finds itself today has followed a carefully laid out plan that was already penned back in 1871 by Albert Pike. I will not go over his letter again, as I've covered this in many previous videos. There is one aspect from this animation that has suddenly been given new meaning in 2022, and that is this scene where a girl with a peace flag runs out to meet oncoming tanks that are preparing for war. Something that I've always wondered about was the significance of the fireworks in the background of this scene with the skeleton, when these peace efforts would seem to be interrupted, and the meaning of the tiger on the back of this girl. Well, in 2022 we have a very specific application for this imagery. It just so happens that we're currently coming up on the Chinese year of the tiger, starting on February 1st, and this is normally celebrated with a lot of fireworks in China. So the question is whether this animation is pointing us to the date on which peace efforts will fail in a situation where tensions would have reached a breaking point. It also stands to reason that some event would have to trigger emergency peace efforts such as a major attack that would require some sort of intervention to prevent further escalation. One morning early in January I was woken up by these words, Keep your eyes on Angelina Jolie. The voice and the words were clear and loud enough to wake me up, and the words were not related to a dream that I had. It was simply a sentence that I heard as an audible voice that woke me up. I've explained in many previous videos that Angelina Jolie would be the closest match for the girl shown in this animation, since she has the same tiger tattooed on her back, and she is also the UN's peace ambassador. So in the coming days I will keep my eyes on her involvement in this brewing and escalating conflict, and it would be very interesting to see if she is pulled into the conflict to act as the UN's peace ambassador, trying to prevent what could become World War III from breaking out. 
If she indeed steps up to assist with trying to prevent escalation and to broker peace, then I believe we have arrived at what we are told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Early in 2021, Seymour Studios released another animation with the title, I Pet Goat 3, which would seem to focus on events right before the start of the tribulation, leading to the rise of the Antichrist, the formation of a one-world religion, the destruction of the world economy, and confirmations on the intentions of the mandates that have been changing our societies over the past two years. This video is now private when you search for it on YouTube, but fortunately there were many who downloaded it and reposted it before they removed it from public view. This animation starts off showing Russia and the US in a fight on top of a roof that one would associate with China. So the connection to China and maybe the Chinese New Year is definitely there. While the one-eyed pyramid that represents those who are controlling everything from behind the scenes would seem to be stressed out or panicking as its demise approaches. This is also shown later in this video. The same message is conveyed in the iPad Go 2 animation, where we see the pyramids being destroyed at the end of the video. In this image you will see that the instrument with which this fallen person is treated is one that the world has now become very familiar with and have accepted often without considering what God's word says about it. The fact that our enemy knew about the conflict that would come about between the West and Russia and telling us about it back in January of 2021, long before it occurred, should tell us that they also know what is behind the substance that is placed inside the bodies of those who accept it. This image shows us what our enemy has to say about the substance that is placed within people's bodies, and the question then is, why would those who are part of our enemy's plan show us that this substance is associated with the mark that we are warned about in the book of Revelation? Even today, we have the majority of the world denying its true purpose. This image clearly shows us the number associated with the abomination that is placed within the temples of God, and that allows the enemy to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember, if you have been deceived by our enemy's lies, just as Eve was deceived, there is still hope, as just as God allowed Adam and Eve to become the enemy's property, so has he allowed many of God's people today to once again become the enemy's property, so that our Heavenly Father can demonstrate his love even to those whom our enemy obtained legally as his possession. We serve a God who is love and who has allowed our enemy to overstep his bounds, so that he could legally take back every person who was stolen by the enemy, not only now, but throughout all the ages. Based on what we are shown in Nebuchadnezzar's statue, and what is written in Proverbs 6 verse 30 to 31, we know that our enemy has entered God's harvest and have begun stealing from God before the appointed time arrived where he would have received a legal portion. Because Satan has done this, I believe many of the judgments that were pronounced over humanity can now be overturned, because Satan broke God's law, and has to make restitution, and will soon be punished for this. As a result of this restitution, I believe hell will be emptied, and the church will be the entity that goes in, breaking down the gates of hell, to legally gather those who fell into the hands of the enemy, but which have to be given back because of Satan's impatience. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, we have an exciting week before us, and I am not sure if our Heavenly Father wanted me to wait until now to release this video, but we will soon know if this understanding is on target. If it is, then we could be with our bridegroom in the next few days, and would that not be just wonderful? We have been waiting for so long, and each time that our hope is deferred, we suffer heartache and pain. 
But with patience and endurance we persevere until the glorious day on which we can fall before the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and thank Him for laying down His life for us, so that we can enter the glory that He prepared for us at the foundation of the world. I hope that this video has blessed you, and I look forward to seeing you in the air soon. God bless. The Bible says that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you will receive salvation. Have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you placed all of your trust in Him to save you from your sins? Jesus shed His precious blood on the cross to set you free from sin, and your sins being washed away and you becoming a fellow heir with Christ as a son or daughter of God is a free gift to anyone who will accept. The only way in which you can obtain this gift is through faith. You cannot earn it, and you cannot pay God back for it once you have it. Would you not accept His gift of eternal life to you today, while there is still time to do so? Do not trust in your own works to save you, even if those works are the works that you do under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus will receive all the glory for every person that He saved, and we can only offer Him our gratitude and worship.